it's many orders of magnitude more complicated than the big problems that the human race has. And yet AI solved this in fall 2020. Welcome to Game Changer, where you get the inside track to win in a decade of disruption. Please help me join, well, please help me grow the Game Changer family. So be sure to subscribe and invite others to subscribe as well. And let's share the love. And really importantly, let's crush this business unusual game together. Our guest today, Kim Solez, is a pathologist and co-founder of the Banff Classification, the first standard international classification for renal transplant biopsies, and he's the professor at the University of Alberta. But wait, this doctor has an arty side. He's the president of the Conan Heights Art Society and lead organizer of the Leonard Cohen International Festival. Leonard Cohen composed the famous song, Hallelujah. And there's more. Kim is also a futurist with big dreams to solve six of the world's key problems. He sees a future where intelligent machines emerge to save the human race. Chronologically, he's 75. Yet in spirit, he's a happy 18-year-old who believes we're just getting started. Welcome, Kim. It's fantastic to have a young man on the show. <laughs> Wonderful to be here. Yep. Kim, you did a NAO PIR personality test earlier this year, and your results yep. show very high openness, activity, fantasy, ideas. So even at 75, you're still seeking out novelty, variety, complexity, and you don't worry What's the secret right. sauce, Kim? <laughs> Share it with us. <laughs> well, you know, it's, it's interesting about that. There, there, there's a narrative report there, and the bottom line says, this cannot change. And I have a feeling that's kind of promotion for the test, because it makes the test seem very important. If <laughs> that result cannot be altered by anything. But of course, life impacts people, and I think personality can change. And what's amusing is the research on this shows that openness usually decreases with age. And since my openness to, to experience is like sky high, <laughs> it's hard to imagine how it could ever have been greater. But uh, yeah, I, I think that life is... is is so a, a mix of things that you create and the things that you started out with. So my father encountering me in the newborn nursery for the first time, he was a physician in training. And so he had a good excuse for not being there when I was born. <laughs> Saw me in the newborn nursery, all these kids lined up and the other kids were crying and bawling and I was smiling and bopping and <laughs> <laughs> something different about this kid. So, so it's kind of been there from the, from the beginning, you know, I'm, I'm a naturally happy person and I don't worry much, about, particularly about things that don't need to be worried about. But the question is whether your listeners whether they can change anything about their personality, whether it's really fixed. I think it is to some extent changeable, but there are also lots of things you can do to take the benefit of whatever personality you actually started with, you know, and, and sort of make, make the most of that. Yeah, for sure. I would say. Yeah. In my experience, we can change it definitely, but uh, you need to have a reason. So, what is driving the increase in openness, the increase in happiness factor? What's your driving force? Well, I think simply stated, there is no upper bound of how big you can think. And most people have a natural upper bound. I think thinking beyond a certain scale 
is just crazy. But like, think about this. This is a megastructure around the earth. Worried about global warming? Okay, global warming would be gone with this. You can make the earth whatever temperature you want. You, you absorb the extra sun's rays and do good things with that energy, right? And so if that seems like gigantic to you, what about this? It's a Kardashev type two civilization where they do the same thing around the sun, right? And so my, my ideas for saving the human race from itself with AI and blockchain all come from the idea of protein folding, which is what's uh, depicted here. And protein folding is something so complicated. If I were to try to explain it to you or you to me, we'd never succeed. The human brain can't understand protein folding. It's many orders of magnitude more complicated than the big problems that the human race has. And yet AI solved this in fall 2020. So that makes you think that AI and also blockchain working together could solve or help solve most of the big problems of the human race, as messy as those problems are. Mm -hmm. So they, these are the, some of the big ideas to sort of uh, saving the world and saving the whole world, not like 1 million, but 8 billion, you know? And, and, and uh, so it's not unreasonable to think about things like that. Somebody needs to be thinking big. Yeah. Okay, so think so supersized and in, on, on such a level that the, com the problems are so complex that maybe it makes whatever issues we're going through seem minuscule <laughs> in comparison. And you have this constant, if you have such a big vision or such a big, um, the, the complexity of the challenge you're looking to solve is so big. Um, you, you have to be buoyant, you have to be changing, you have to be open, you have to keep, keep your mind alert. Right, and there has to be something that gives you the confidence you could succeed, mm -hmm. right? And that's something that's actually very simple. That if you think of having agency in the world, being able to change things, most people have the assumption that their voice will not be listened mm -hmm. to. And of course, there's lots to kind of support that. But that's what we thought. So in January, 2018, Ashita Mogi and I started doing videos complaining about inaccurate depictions of AI and the future online. And the remarkable thing was every single one of those videos was reacted to, things changed, usually so completely, the only evidence of what we were originally complaining about were the screen captures we had in our video. All other evidence was, was gone. But the other element of that is our influence was not acknowledged, nor did we expect it to be. So these were big, important, famous entities making changes. There's no reason that they should say, we took down this page because Kim Solis and Ashita Mogi <laughs> complained. No, they just took it down, right? Without saying why, but within a few days after our video. And this sort of happened over and over. And then she and I went to a meeting together. We thought, well, isn't this curious? I've been teaching about the future of medicine for 10 years. I sort of had the lexicon down, you know? I know the words that represent the future of medicine. And, you know, it, it, it's easy to think of them, you know, artificial intelligence, uh, um, ex vivo perfusion, regenerative medicine, single cell transcriptomics, and on and on, right? Why is it? Because at this big meeting we're at, where the meeting program contains none of those words of the future. So we went to the exhibit area and found the biggest, most expensive exhibit. We went to that exhibit and we said, could we talk to your thought leader? And that was easy to identify. And this very charming guy, the thought leader for this largest exhibit there, said, 
can I help you? And we describe this problem. Why is <laughs> these words that are so emblematic of the future of medicine are nowhere in the program of this meeting and other large medical meetings? Why is that? And he said, Dr. Solas, I know it sounds odd, but there are always strong forces opposed to progress for very good reason that the status quo is in their interest. They're selling a product which is really old and tired, but it still has good sales and they want to keep it that way, you know? And, and, and so that those are the people who oppose those words and those ideas appearing in the program. And like that's an, an insight that was very valuable. Mm -hmm. And I, I guess we're asking questions at a larger scale, right? Nobody else is, is asking that question. They may complain about individual facets of the meeting, but why the future is completely left out of the meeting, that's a bigger question no one else is asking. And yeah, so that, that kind of... Um, change things too. We then began complaining about meeting programs. And I, I mentioned single cell transcriptomics. A few days after one of our videos complaining about this, the top guy, the most prominent guy in that field of single cell transcriptomics became the program chair for the, one of the big upcoming kidney meetings. And uh, yeah, it, 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 and once again, there was no acknowledgement. You know, mm -hmm. We made this guy the program chair because no, why, why, why should they say, say that? They just did it, right? And, mm -hmm. and so, and then there, there, there's a, a free magazine that every pathologist gets around the world. What is it called? The Pathologist. <laughs> I mean, it's sort of, sort of obvious, right? And it, it has heavy, heavy corporate support. And the depiction of AI and the future they were giving was completely fabricated. They were saying, there's no way that artificial intelligence will ever replace physicians. Don't worry about a thing. You know, it'll only be adjunctive and so on. And uh, so I complained about that. And within a few months, the editorial theme of, of the magazine changed. And now they were saying things like, won't pathology be great? Because if you're a woman who wants to, to spend time with your family, there'll be part-time jobs that, that you may not have thought about before. It'll be very satisfying. And so not because machines will be doing a lot of the work. Yeah. Hmm. So so we, we, we really feel empowered because we we have accomplished a lot and so it makes us think why not keep on going so kim what this, you're you know? saying and part of it is it's, you what you're yeah. saying is there are opposing forces yet when you bring it to people's attention when you ask the questions when you start opening up the conversation things can change right. So if we, if more people yeah. were willing to do that and to tackle potentially the opposing forces, because who, who are the opposing forces anyway? Maybe it's just asking the right questions of the right people, which allows the change yeah. to start happening, which is what you're doing. Right. And, and, and I think... One thing that your listeners may be wondering, well, how do we put this guy in a category? You know, <laughs> well, what, what category is he in? I'm surprising. I'm officially surprising. So there are students who have worked with me who've asked for letters of recommendation for like going to university, getting into pro programs and so on, not talking about things in general, but they say, I aspire to be as surprising as you are. And I think saying that would make me look really good because the world likes surprising yes, people. Yes. Surprising people can make things happen that otherwise would not happen. Mm. So, so, so I think that's really what it is, is, is um, 
not really coming off as strange and, and weird, but just being downright surprising. Right? And what, what, you know, what where did that you, idea came Yeah, from? what a yeah. lovely way of putting it, Kim. You know, it's like bringing some awe and wonder and surprise and mystery into it. So all of a sudden, it doesn't look right. so it doesn't look so scary. It looks quite oh well, this could be quite interesting actually. Let's, let's yeah. open it up. Now think, think think of the world future society. Doesn't that sound big and important? <laughs> and wow, huh? but they they uh, they're not as big as that sounds. And and they they were kind of starting to rebrand themselves and coming up with some metaphors, right? And they had the metaphor of the symphony. And <laughs> I thought that was kind of small for the World Future Society. And I said, what about the music of the spheres? Which, you know, it is, is an ancient concept of the mathematical, you know, correlation between orbits of planets and all, all, all these kinds of things, that it all comes together as a kind of mu musical thing happening and that, that when we look at the night sky, that's really what we're looking at is the, the, the music of the spheres. And so this person putting together a new plan for the World Future Society said, where did you get that idea? <laughs> too big. I, can't. I said, no, but it's much more exciting than symphony. You know, I, I get symphony, but yeah, uh, why, why not make it the music of the spheres? <laughs> so it, it, it's, it's uh, good for people to have this brief glimpse into a much larger world, much larger universe mm. than they previous thought of. Mm. And, and uh, so that's one of the nice things about it. I mean, what, what you'll notice is that there's no um, mention of shareholder value. Right? <laughs> I mean, yes. You couldn't create a company to do this. It's too big. You can't own the intellectual property for all the stuff that I'm talking about. You know, I couldn't put like the Kim Solis brand on it. But if I solve one of the big problems of, 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 of the human race with this approach, don't you think people are gonna kind of seek me out for, for, for other things? Yeah, exactly. So it will benefit me yeah. financially. It, it, it will create making st structures easier. But you, you don't have to focus on that. And the other thing is about timeless content. You'll find I have a lot of timeless content. Everybody, everybody listening values timeless content, but they realize that corporations don't create that because you can't remain competitive. If you don't have a new brand and a new look and so on, or competing with others <laughs> and so on. So you can't have something that, 10 to 15 years and you're still promoting the value of after 10 to 15 years, that's crazy. No corporation would do that. But all the best writing, all the, the, the best art has that characteristic mm -hmm. exactly. It is 10 to 15 or you know, 100 or, or 1,000 years old and people still value it, right? So timeless content I think it's hard to find anybody who really opposes it, but also nobody's working on it because it's, it's not practical at, at the level that they're thinking of. It just can't happen. No, you need to change. But at the highest level, there is no competition at all. There's only collaboration. Yes. So I don't feel that I'm competing with anyone. But the, but the interesting thing is how generalizable are my, my ideas? What about people looking in and saying, this guy is the futurist. He's talking about the future. And a, a, a podcast host, Luke Robert Mason, brought to my attention the idea that futurism and the future is regarded by some people as a cult. <laughs> you know, it's like a very minority thing. No, you know, who thinks about that? Like politicians maybe think about the next three or four years and not 
beyond. So who, who would think about the long, long range future? So can we generalize what I'm talking about? Absolutely, without using the word future at all. One of the things that I'm talking about is influencing the governance of large important entities that have no formal mechanism for outside influence on how they are governed. I think a lot of people in the corporate world would, be, would find that interesting. You know, people who think all decisions are being made, being made internally, they don't care what the outside world thinks, they get together and decide how this company's running or how this entity's running, you can still influence them if you're surprising enough. <laughs> and they may not even realize that you've done that, but you have done that, right? And, and so, yeah. And then what if some of your listeners think, well, that's too much about business. I just care about real life. Okay, well, the real life thing, the message that I have is a very simple one and important. Life doesn't peak at a certain age and then it's all downhill from there. That is absolutely not the way life works. When I was younger, I thought getting old was about having complaints of, you know, aches and pains and things going wrong and things not working and have that be permanent, right? It never goes away. Well, I'm 75, I've been 75 now for three months. There is nothing in my life that reminds me that I'm old <laughs> and things happen that do go away. Like in, in 2015, I, I had some lower back pain and it happened <laughs> at a time that I, I was going to a meeting called Wisdom Engaged about uh, you know indigenous peoples in Canada, what they know and how you can bring that wisdom and apply it to nor normal life. And I found it, the two had nothing to do with, with each other, just, you know, coincidence. But during that meeting, first of all, most people like me, most non, you know, indigenous people attending the meeting, gradually their attendance tailed off. Toward the end, there was like only me and a couple of other um, people. And, 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 <laughs> my back pain subsided during that meeting and it has never come back. And <laughs> at the final session of, of that Wisdom Engaged meeting, they announced that we were going to have dinner and they would serve the elders first. I thought, well, that makes a lot of sense. And they brought food to me right away. And <laughs> wait, there must be some mistake. They said, no, you're an elder now, you know? <laughs> Oh, wow. The cool thing about it, there seemed to be no responsibilities. You know, that happened, but it's not like the next day they brought me this list of things that I had to do. No, it's just change in status without any list of things that I had, had, hmm. had to do. But it sort of gives you an idea of how generalizable yes. this is. My mentor in kidney medicine, Robert Heptonstall, was an excellent lecturer and one of the things that made his lectures interesting was bringing himself into it. So when, it, when, when he talked about the, the kidney, he talked about what the kidney does, it makes urine and talks about the, the, the urinary stream, which he said, narrows with age. And listening to him, I thought, oh no, that's my future. You know, the future of my urinary stream is gonna narrow with age. So exactly that, that happened in the first half of 2020. And I, oh, no. But in July of 2020, the urinary stream went back <laughs> to normal <laughs> and has stayed that way. So, so like everything that has happened that I thought, okay, this is like me getting old and this problem is never going to go away. There hasn't been anything like that. Thus far, and I, I don't know that there will be. Yeah, so Kim, you're yeah. doing something interesting then. What do you think? So there's the perception, the general perception that things change and shift, and, and there's these generalized ways of thinking, and that everybody's going to go through that. What? When something happens to you, are you potentially maybe not buying into it? Maybe 
Not yeah, to... yeah. I I think that there are kind of spiritual exchanges in the world that we don't really understand, right? And if I, I'm not postulating anything specific because I don't know what it is, but something about me being confident that the best part of my life is always in the future yes. you know, makes my body be less able to, to kind of embrace some permanent disability, mm. right? It, it, just doesn't work for me somehow because it's it's different from my general trajectory yeah. whereas if you spend most of your days talking about how old and tired you are and so on then i think new aches and pains fit right in with that and say, See, i am old and tired because now i got a new one and another one and yeah yeah i think you you're actually you've created a different reality for yourself you've created a reality where you are you've got the 18 year old energy the curiosity you constantly in surprise you discovering new things all the time and you surround yourself by very young people too and you're yeah. you're in a, a variety of things you're not allowing anything to just become patterned you know, okay, on a Friday, I go to, you know, to play bowls. And on Saturday, I'm right. going to play. My activities are less predictable yeah. than any other family member. Ordinarily, the younger the person, the more unpredictable. I I, I, I am consistently the least <laughs> predictable family member. And I'm, I'm, I'm kind of proud of that. And I think the other thing is people don't realize how often famous, important people in, in the world who probably don't even know your name do things that benefit you. Let's take Bono of, of, mm -hmm. of, of the band U2. Now, I wrote about something that really intrigued me about him, that he says he really enjoys going to meetings where you look at the picture of the meeting, say those people have no business being in the same room together. And I thought, isn't that exciting that Bono <laughs> thinks that? And so I wrote about it, but of course he had written about it and it was on his websites. But now in 2021, the only place you can read about it is on my websites. Because on his, you can think of the reason that for a famous person, this really wouldn't work well in the long run. It gives really, you know, the weirdos out there the idea that they can meet with you, right? It says so right here. People who are no business being in the same room together, you know, I'm that kind of person I want to meet with. Yeah. So maybe for very good reasons, it didn't work for him long term. But it benefited me very much. It's a much more memorable thing as a story about him than if I made it a story about me. Who the heck cares that I feel that way? I, I generally do feel that way. And then the, the risk that comes from having those kinds of meetings where you're so different from everybody else in the room, I, I've, I've gotten very good at sort of figuring that out. We had for many years here from 2014 to 2020, Tuesday night poetry at the Nook Cafe. And I was like 50 years older than everybody else. It was sort of like young people at risk with the best poetry in town because the moment they had left their house, if they had a place to live, they, their lives were at risk practically every moment and so on. And that made a really good poetry, right? And and yeah, so I provided the lighting, the video, video editing, and so on. Some of the people were indeed homeless. And so we would negotiate about their video editing with them using the computers at the library. But then if you think about, well, what's the risk to me? Let's talk about the risk to me. I learned not to give people rides home. Their lives were quite different from mine. And that just didn't work. Suddenly it was just them and me, one other person in the car and my going to some of the worst areas of town. And so that really didn't work for me. But you might think of another risk. Well, 
you're the only physician there. You're the only academic there. You know, you and and don't you feel you know responsible for things you really can't handle? Well, in a way, yeah, because like one fifth of the poetry was about mental illness and suicide ideation, and one fifth of the poetry was about sexual assault, and but. Actually, the poetry leaders in town, they had all taken suicide prevention training, which I hadn't. And so I felt, I don't have to worry. You know, it's not like they turn to the physician, they turn to the person <laughs> that the poetry community knows has suicide prevention training. And actually there were no uh, suicides during that whole time in, in, in you know, directly associated with this uh, Tuesday night poetry. And, and sexual assault, we had a standard list of sort of the local resources in that area that we, we could, you know, remind people of. So it actually became, became quite comfortable. And then let's talk about something similar. The poverty simulation exercise from the United Way. That, that's very similar to my poetry experience. So I, I went to this two and a half hour thing where I, I, I pretended to be an impoverished person and you got various challenges and you have, have to decide how to meet them. And I was very proud of how, how I did. I did fairly well. I you know kept my home and other things and I learned a lot. I learned that you often, if, if you're going everywhere by taxi, you often get there during the lunch hour and all government offices are closed during the lunch hour. So it really doesn't work. Yeah, a lot, a lot of things. So I come back to the hospital. I'm so excited by this experience that I've just had. And everybody around me just looks at me like, I am the most idiotic person. And I realized they all think as follows. The moment I became a physician, I realized there's zero chance I'm going to be impoverished. So I stopped thinking about mm -hmm. poverty. But poverty and you know, racial injustice and so on underlies a lot of human illness. It's an important background. Oh. And, and, and the course that I teach talks about medicine writ large, which is the social responsibility of medicine yeah so I, I was just so disappointed in my colleagues where they could they didn't share my excitement at all they thought I had really wasted two and a half hours and yeah, why didn't I do something important yeah. yeah well but there's something really different about you Kim and it's the reason why you're the person looking to solve these bigger challenges and and complexities in the world because it takes different people to do that and it takes a, a, a mind that doesn't think in the box <laughs> you know and and doesn't label you according to okay the physician should be thinking like this going to these things going to these particular places right. with these people that's what keeps us the same so you've broken through that to bring to the world new discoveries right. and and new solutions tell me what you see the world looking like so you you look through a very different lens and you see yep. that um there's going to be um i, I think you sp speak about a certain um let me just see what my was it a standard no no you, it was a the future standard that's what i wanted to talk about yeah yes what is yes. that future yes. standard that right. you see that we could be moving towards well the, the thing that has interested me the most is the most famous tech writer today, Yuval Noah Harari, uh, says, no one knows what the world will look like in 2050. But it's kind, kind of amusing. There are these standard image sites, uh, Shutterstock, Adobe Stock. There are many of them, image sites where you go to find images. And if you just put in 2050, this, they're all the exactly. images. So, so those image sites know what, what 2050 might be like. And, and uh, there are a lot of things you'd like to prevent, like more plastic in the ocean and fish and you know, simple things like that. Um, and so 
I think that the, the reason that it seems to many people like the future is a complete question mark that we can have no insight into what's actually going to happen is they're thinking of human beings only. And that's not how it's going to work. You, you, you can think about our relationship to sentient machines, to, fair, to computers smarter than us. What is that relationship? Well, we will have created those sentient machines. They're sort of like our children, right? So if you include them in the, in the, the, the plans for the future, then it becomes easy to figure out what the future will be like with sentient machines and human beings working together. And it could be a very positive future. It is not already determined. We can help shape that future. We all have agency to help move things in a positive direction. So the world of the future is much better than the world of today. If you think of like, when you wake up today, the first thing you think about is all the things you want to have, you can never have all the things you want to do, you can never do. And, you know, just all these regrets. Whereas it could be a post scarcity world, right? Where neither one of those things are true. The price of valuable things come down to practically zero. You can have whatever you want and you can have any experience that you want. Virtual reality is better than real, shareable with friends. So suddenly we need to figure out, okay, so probably also in that world, we won't have jobs, right? And, and so how do you make sense? What is the meaning of life then when you can have anything you want, any experience that you want, and you don't have to work? So what, what, what will give your life meaning now? And like, um, the funny thing about that is you'd say, well, it depends upon how creative you are. But if you go to, in your own environment, the person you think is the least creative person that you know, and ask them how important creativity is in their life, they'll tell you it's very creative, that, that, that it's very important that they are very you know, creative, even though that's not what you think of them. So, <clears throat> I think a world where creativity is the main thing that we're striving for will work just fine because in a sense, everybody thinks of themselves as being creative. And so there is work for everybody to do there, even if it's not required to live, it, 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 it's a way. So you can spend your day either being creative yourself or using the creative creativity of other people for you know immersive uh, virtual reality and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. So are your courses helping people bridge these gaps that they have in terms of being able to think of the future, being able to think in more meaning terms, being able to see a future with this um, sort of connection, different kind of connection right. with, with um, AI? Is that what your courses are, are doing? Yes, but I, I would point out that there is no compulsion in the course. It isn't like we force people to take the course or once they learn what it's about, force them to stay in the course even if they don't like it. No, I think really what we're doing, we're creating a filter. The University of, of Alberta has 40,000 students and every year <clears throat> somewhere between 10 and 20 of them take my course, uh, and they really are a subset of the human race who like, has more feeling of being invested in the long range future, caring about the, the, the fate of their fellow humans and that sort of thing. But if you think about it, there, there is evidence that more people should have those interests because the time will come when these sentient machines smarter than we are will have decisions to make about us, right? And that decision of whether to accommodate humans on the earth to spend a lot of resources to keep humans happy, which probably AI will be much better at doing than actually other humans are, 
depends upon the basic human, basic goodness of human beings, which is something we all sort of believe in, but it's a background belief. We, we don't spend much time talking about it or proving that it exists. And every newscast you might accidentally watch, like a lot of your listeners don't listen to the news, don't watch the news, but they might accidentally hear some or see some. And everything in the current newscasts are, argues in the other direction against the basic goodness of human beings. And so if the sentient machines feel there is no evidence for the basic goodness of human beings, then they won't do anything bad to us. They'll just ignore us, right? Like, like we don't really hate ants or hate grasshoppers or anything, but when we see one, we, we don't think much about it, right? We just go on. And, and, and so that's the way it will be. We'll be completely ignored by this uh, wow. much smarter than human uh, uh, entity. Where, whereas if we do seem worth keeping around, and, and yeah, then, 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 then it could be a very positive outcome. We could be happier and lead more more enriching lives than was ever the case before. And that this question of where human culture is, is, is going is maybe one of the things that I'm proudest of. In 2018, Yuval Noah Harari gave an interview in which he said that in the future, human culture will be wrecked because every plot line of every movie, TV show, play, so on, everything, every creative work plot line requires humans to make decisions. And the big decisions in the future will leave to sentient machines because they'll make much better decisions when you're deciding what to do with your life, who to marry, where to live, all those things. Your friends who let the sentient machines make those decisions, their lives will prosper and thrive Whereas the people who try to make those decisions themselves will falter and, <laughs> and fail. So he was saying all human culture will be wrecked because all those plot lines will be wrecked. And I said, that is ridiculous. Humans are adaptable. <laughs> and if there's that much extra intellect around somehow, then we can use that to lead multiple lives at once and keep them straight. The reason we can't do that today is we'd make terrible mistakes, you know, but FOMO would be gone. You never have this regret of having missed out on this because it's the same time as that. You couldn't be in both places at once. Now you will be able to be able to keep, and the parties in the evening, where all your multiple instances of self come together, we so great because they're so compatible because in the end, they're all you. <laughs> uh, you have a, a fascinating, surprising way of thinking about these things. So Kim, I asked you to share a, a powerful success, success insight that would be of value to our audience? What, we call it a wisdom on this show. What wisdom would you love to share with us? So the greatest opportunities in my life have come when I hear the following phrase, oh, that's way too complicated. And that's saying a lot of things. It's saying, I think that's important. I'm not going to do it myself because I feel that I, I don't really have the skills to fix it, you know. And what the person who says that doesn't realize is no one who fixes big problems knows how they're going to do it entirely at the time they start working on it. <laughs> it's on the job training for, for the men and women who, who, who make those big insights. They didn't have all the insights in the first day that they decided to do it. They just had the confidence that they could do it. And a life without precedent 
is much easier than a life with precedent. You're saying, oh, no, no, I, I, I want to have a, a, a like career path similar to other people and, and so on. And then, but if you do that, then it's easy to measure your progress, right? <laughs> and see how you're slower than other people and not doing as well. And, you know, your metrics look really lousy compared to the other people trying to do the same thing you're doing. Whereas if you're doing something no one's done before, and in almost every field, there's a lot of options for new things to be done from a different vantage point, a different point of view, then there's no way to criticize you. And no one will ever <laughs> know how bad you were at the skills when you started and how much improvement has, has occurred. So like I'm, I'm known for generating consensus and I'm very proud of, 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 of that. If, if you read books about generating consensus, they all say, get a professional facilitator. He'll come in into the room, teach your people a new way to think, put post-its on, on the board and magically this uh, you know, new consensus will, will emerge. But in specialized areas like uh, medicine, that doesn't really work. You, you, you can't have a you know, facilitator who doesn't know anything about the subject. And particularly when it's, it's not really life and death. You can imagine if you're deciding about life and death things, maybe you need a third party. But when it's not like that, you, you need somebody who is an actual expert in the area, but who also has the skills to moderate consensus. And that's what I've been doing now for 34 years. And so um, that requires being humble, sort of humble leadership. If the voices in the room clearly favor somebody else's idea, you need to let that person speak more. You need to sort of follow the will of the group. And, and yeah, so that, that's, that's what I've been doing. But was I really skilled at that at the beginning? Absolutely not. When I, when I began this in, in like 1991, um, so, or even if you look back at 1988, um, like when I, I started the, uh, the uh, International Society of Nephrology Disaster Relief Task Force, how to save people after earthquakes. They have a lot of problems that may, may need medical intervention from the outside. How are you going to ha handle that? So I'd be at the end of this long table of important physicians from around the world. And I'd say one thing, and half the people there would stiffen. Like, I can't believe he said something so <laughs> stupid. And I would say something else, and the other half would stiffen. I can't believe he said something so stupid again, you know. But gradually, I, 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 I got a little better at that. And no one has ever criticized the rate at which our progress, you know, no, nobody had ever done what I was doing before. So how, how do you know how long it should how? take, right? So I love it. I just want to repeat it then. Leading a life without precedent is much easier than leading a life with one. Yeah. So, because you're always trying something new. Really, really, right. it's, a, it's a fascinating whiz bomb in the way in which you brought it into context. So tell me, Kim, right now with the level of disruption we're experiencing around us globally, what would you say to entrepreneurs is two things. To win in a decade of dis constant, consistent disruption like this, what do they need to start and what should they stop right away? Right. So I let me just give a, a, a kind of background thought here. Everything I've talked about thus far is not affected by the mm -hmm. pandemic. Yes. The things I've talked about are still true during the pandemic, before and after. So they, they're not really influenced by the pandemic. And I think that they, they have to sort of um, 
hold in their mind two conflicting sort of ideas that life is so desperate and so on right now that we just got to focus on on the here and now and who cares about tomorrow let's just get us through this you know covid test or this person who's now has a fever and beginning to cough and stuff you know yeah so at that and and then the kind of long range future you know to have the you know ability to hold both those ideas in your mind at once of 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 uh, yeah what are we going to do today what are the practical uh, realities what's the new government restriction our borders open our borders closed you know whatever but what are we trying to do in the long run yeah and how can we be confident of success with that hmm. and i think even think about well you know there's certain no, but, like even think of the likelihood that eventually we will live in a world without money there won't be reason for money money is you've all know harari has pointed out is a fiction it it's not something real it, it's a, you know convenient important fiction so um i i went to an uh, indian community oroville that has not used money for a long time very interesting um and i learned a lot being there and and talking to the people there but very shortly after i left there was a brutal murder there <laughs> and so i realized that's not the like solution to everything right there there, there is no one solution you know mm. to to some extent you have to enjoy complexity in your life there's nothing wrong with complexity your significant other whoever they are they're complex that's good right you want a really simple significant other that'd be boring right so yeah so it, don't don't be put off by you know complexity when we talk about richness of human life i can't imagine that not being complex it is going to be complex yeah mm, the, the, there's nothing to fear in that. definitely so what do you think we need to stop doing so i i guess this is something that none of us expected to ever have to say but being you know deceitful and 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 mm -hmm. making up stuff to try to benefit people who shouldn't be benefited you know mm -hmm. so it, it, in in a previous era you would say well that's ridiculous nobody's doing that but now in, in every newscast we find that people are doing that and some of the newscasters themselves are actually doing it so yeah that that's what we need to stop doing mm -hmm. i think there are, there are two things that are, are more valuable than we think one is the truth and the other is solitude if you think about my life it's it's kind of interesting you you talk about all the young people around me that's true but also like you know today i'm the only person in the anatomical pathology complex right now that is very often the case and i love it here people can't figure out there are a lot of people who complain about the workplace that i i i seem to voluntarily <laughs> spend like extra time here i'm frequently the only person there so yeah we 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 need to kind of rethink what's important in life and and not just have kind of knee jerk reactions to things we have to hang out with people your own age you have to do what they do that leads to a very boring life and and, <laughs> and i think yeah and 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 if you think well what changes could could you make you can't really make changes you talk brave but you can't make changes no like i became a uh, vegetarian uh 3 years ago and that that might seem and i'm you know the only one one in my family 
And why? Well, <laughs> because a lot of um, AI leaders believe that when machines are smarter than we are, they will really look down on people who, who kill other animals to uh, eat them, right? <laughs> so, but anyway, the family accepted that quite readily. And, and, and there, there are many things like that. Big, like I, one, one of my mentors, Lillian Stryker, we, we were driving around Baltimore early in my uh, career at Johns Hopkins. And we stopped at a light and she said, Kim, never reject the idea of making a really big change in your life, moving a, to a new country, starting a new career, you know, learning a new language, everything different. I thought, this is crazy. She would never do this. Why is she? But she did do that. <laughs> she had six kids. She left her life in France, started a new life in the U.S., was as successful with that new life she started in the U.S. And her youngest child, originally, uh, it, it was thought that, that the youngest child should stay with her. No, and, and that didn't work. So she really did start over. And the fa family seemed to benefit too. Um, I, I won't go into too many details, but it, it was remarkable really how well that all worked. Mm, it's like you you might say, well, that's crazy. That We're uh, adaptable, you yeah. said earlier. We're, yeah. we're absolutely yeah. adaptable. Yeah. Kim, I've got a, just two more questions for you. First one is, you, you've got this look into the future. You're living in the future all the time, trying to see what, it, what, what it's going to bring us. For you, looking through that lens, what's the scariest thing that you see that, that's coming? And what's the most exciting thing for you? In a nutshell, how would you describe those two things? Yeah, I, I don't know if I see something that's definitely scary. I see things mm -hmm. that could be scary, I guess. Mm -hmm. And, and, and uh, like um, you, you, you could imagine a kind of uh, simplistic totalitarian world where for whatever reason, human freedom is quite limited um, and, and it's hard to find people to negotiate your freedom with, right? I mean, maybe, you know, impossible. You're in a situation that you really cannot change. So that, that's, that's I, I think, the worst outcome. And the best outcome is the post-scarcity uh, world that I've been describing, um, which, um, you know, when you see a friend on the street, there would only be success stories to share. Um, there would be new, you know, emotions and 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 so on. If you think of the idea of mind uploading, um, it it's going to be a lot longer way than Ray Kurzweil thinks. He he said it would would occur and be successful in the 2030s. That's like in the next 19 years. I I don't think that's correct. But when we have that. You, you'll be able to dial up, you know, all sorts of emotions and feelings we're incapable of, of, of having now. The world will be much richer than it is now. And, and uh, you, yeah, and, and then, you know, blockchain, you're, <laughs> one of the things about blockchain is you need something to kind of guarantee the, the documented history of, of things, right? What is true? What isn't? You know, so for instance, in artificial intelligence, in the reinforcement learning area, a, a an artificial intelligent agent may have a reward, and you can think that in a world gone wrong, those agents can hack their own reward, right? And so, give themselves rewards when they haven't earned it, or change the character of the reward. So, you know, blockchain could prevent that, could keep the you know, rewards the same. So it's really uh, 
AI and blockchain working together that that could guarantee this positive future. Okay, so I just wanted to mention that um, on September 15th, uh, academia.edu is going to begin a course of mine called How AI and Blockchain Can Save Humanity from Itself and Soon. And um, yeah, so, so um, it's very nice that we have this uh, podcast here just, just about at the time that that's starting so we can bring both of those exciting things together, you know? <laughs> anyway. This is uh, Einstein, and he's the only uh, Sony Ivo robotic dog of this model in Canada. And he's very happy to see you and your listeners and the people watching. So yeah, he, he was named by the people on my uh, Instagram channel, which is just Kim Solez. And it's quite interesting because that channel is run by a 25 year old musician. And if you direct message me on Instagram, she is the person actually replying. And she she gives really excellent uh, Kim <laughs> Solo's replies. <laughs> yeah, so you so you might want to try that. And you'll find uh, it quite a useful orientation for our uh, <laughs> Instagram channel. Yeah. But that's how uh, Ein uh, Einstein got, got his name. Uh, yeah. Love Einstein. And thanks <laughs> for sharing with us. Thanks for bringing Einstein on. Really oh, cute. Yeah. And um, I'll Definitely. have the um, link to the academia course in the show notes. Thanks for that, Excellent. Kim. Yeah, we look forward to Sounds seeing great. it. Sounds oh, great. Okay, <laughs> super. Uh, awesome thought to have this post-scarcity society. So if you were to wrap up in a thought where what's the ultimate change we need to make to lead us to post-scarcity? Well, yeah, I, I think just uh, realize there's no upper bound to how big you can think mm -hmm. and uh, or to how positive the world and the universe could be, you know? And, and um, so think of those pictures I showed. Those are, those are Kardashev type one civilization with a megastructure around the earth, Kardashev type two with a megastructure around the sun. So think of, of, of the possibilities would be there if we controlled all of you know, the energy of the sun, all, all the things we could do, it's just you know, really, really amazing and yet possible. You know, it's not sort of inconceivable. And then think of, you know, the beauty of life. So think of like game playing. In 2016, when um, computers um, surpassed humans and playing Go, that occurred about 10 years earlier than we thought. A lot of people from Asian societies think that Go is like a part of their culture and so human, so uniquely human, you know. But what happened is once um, the focus turned to computers playing Go, the, the game playing became much more beautiful with, with many attributes it never would have had if only humans were playing with. So just think of that as a metaphor for everything else in our lives. We think the beauty we've got is that's as good as it can get, right? Life could be much more interesting, much more beautiful than it is today. We're working alongside AI and blockchain. So yeah, that's kind of the final thought. Thank you, Kim. What a, what a surprise. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you found it. <laughs> and 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 uh, yes, it's it's wonderful to spend spend time with someone who thinks in a surprisingly different way, who kind of busts all the myths, and makes it your duty to go and bust those myths. And you're you're a living testament 
testimony to the fact that at 75, you can be starting, you can be embarking on all these amazing, big, huge, complex um, challenges. And that because that space is um, not competed, you can have a lot of fun having, <laughs> dreaming up. Right. The, the most, um, what other people <laughs> might say, is absolute crazy, ridiculous ideas. So, right. thank you for bringing yeah. the spark of energy Perfectly. like you've got on the, the screen there. <laughs> <laughs> so I think maybe your uh, audience needs some guarantees that something I'm talking about is a- actually true. So I have a uh, contract now with, with a big company for a sizable sum and it's going through 2028 so the 2028 is seven years from now uh-huh. and they they don't have any question that i i will be unable to <laughs> complete the contract so yeah that that's just yeah so if if, if you think about uh, being um able and, and able to really you know contribute to society society in your 80s, that is certainly possible. Many famous people have done that, are doing that today. But I think it's kind of empowering for people to think um, that they're not past their prime. Mm. (laughs) Your prime is always in the future, right? I was not funny. I didn't, and and I wasn't um, capable of poetry that would satisfy large audiences before 2013. And, and somebody once said, said to me after I cracked a joke, not a very good one, Dr. Solos, I had no idea you had any sense of humor at all. So that's <laughs> not something you say to somebody who's really good at humor, right? So no, they, 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 those are just two a- areas in, in which I've clearly gotten better. I have over 1500 videos that you I don't want your viewers to watch them all but if they do they'll notice that I've gotten smoother and sort of more interesting less boring moments <laughs> as time has uh, got along uh-huh. in the production of those 1500 videos uh-huh. well thank you for giving us so much to think about and just expanding our own universes <laughs> and i mean if i think You're about myself welcome. At um, nearly 30 years, your ju- you know, younger, I'm thinking, oh my yeah. word, if at 75 he thinks it's just starting, <laughs> well, then I've got lifetimes ahead of me. <laughs> right, right. Well, you see, when one of the things that happens with podcasts and that sort of sort of thing, this is common metaphor of the first and second half of your life. So, you know, that, that, that like 75 would be the first half. So if the second half goes to 150, that's interesting. Exactly. Because the Hayflick limit for human cells when cells stop dividing is 140 years, we think. So that would be even going 10 years beyond <laughs> the point at which humans... And, and of course, no woman has lived... Uh, longer than, than, than 123 years and no man, I think 113, yeah. So, so there are certain metrics for how long people have already lived that make it seem probably not that likely that I'll make it to 150. But I'm, I'm doing pretty well. So. Uh, g- given how you busting everything, Kim, um, l- l- let's chat in, in 70 years time again. <laughs> Sounds good. Let's, I, let's schedule I it in. That, Carmen. <laughs> All right. Kim, thank we'll you for being that. here. We'll book okay. it. Let's book it. I don't know if our calendar <laughs> allows for it, but we'll we'll see what, <laughs> what it can do. And thank you for the surprising hour that Sounds we've had good. together, Kim. And um, we're watching this surprising space. And to the Game Changer family, thank you again for... Um, as usual, being here and sharing this magical time. And I know I'm certainly pumped to keep going for at least (laughs) another 100 years. And um, join us, join us on this amazing, surprising, unpredictable journey of truth and possibility. So um, subscribe if you're not subscribed. Yeah, sounds good. Subscribe if you're not subscribed yet and get more people to join this Game Changer family. So sending you oceans of love. Until next time. (laughs) Okay.
Great. Thank you. <laughs>